I'm sitting slow. Hang on. Oh, God. No, I'm just, I'm not Did that we old. Did it? I'm not that old. Okay, this is Scott Hanselman. Uh, you ready? Yeah, I'm good. Hey, okay, so for today's episode, we have Scott Hanselman. Scott, can you introduce yourself and tell us what your role is here? I'm Scott Hanselman. I, I guess I'm a managed community for Visual Studio for developer division. Uh, so I guess I'm a community manager, but my title is program manager. So PM, right? Jack of all trades, yeah. still of all trades, none. Master of none. <laughs> okay. So in the beginning, like, I, what I really like to do is like get a little bit of resolution on what you think of as the role. So that's kind of the title, and it sort of gives us a sense of it. But like, so what, what do you look at as like the day to day of your role, and like how do you measure success for it, for instance? Okay. So right now I'm focused on making sure that we have a healthy community okay. in both .NET and then Visual Studio generally. Uh, my major role this last kind of year or 18 months in the team that I've got, Maria and Jamie and John and Jeff on my team, are all focused on making the on-ramp into .NET and the on-ramp into Visual Studio onto the freeway into our community is a smooth, fun, exciting, and inclusive environment. So from the moment that you go and Google with Bing for learning C Sharp to right-click publish in Visual Studio, it, did anything suck? Like, did you fall off the path did in you fall some off the path? Did you find it a problem? Was the docs not good? Are the samples not good? Did, did something in Visual Studio perplex you? Did an issue with Azure Sign Up become a problem? You know, inclusion means everybody. So that could mean someone on dial-up in New Zealand. It could be someone <laughs> okay. on an airplane. It could be, you know, someone with fast internet, someone with slow internet, someone with a fast computer. Everything from the, huh, I wonder if I should learn C Sharp. Learn C Sharp, enter. <laughs> until, ah, I've just made the new, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon clone, right-click publish. Did they have a good experience? So all of that is making sure we have a healthy community. Cool. And so uh, putting it in the context of, of what we've been doing in the show, um, you're our second program manager person, title person. Cool. But, and I think also you're, you, you do management. So those are yeah. like two, two elements of it. Okay, cool. So. Um, let's start with a little bit of like your kind of journey through your career. So you've been at Microsoft for 2007, 12 I think. 12 years? Yeah. Almost 13? I don't know, something like that. 12 years, sounds like. Okay. So uh, help, help me, how did we get here and, and oh then where do we go from there? Yeah. I was born a poor child. <laughs> um, oh, well, I was. Um, let me think about that. So I have been in software for money uh, since 1992 when I was doing Visual Basic 3 on SQL Server 4.21 <laughs> uh, and Word 6, I think, had just come out. And uh, we were using NT, Windows NT 351. And I was working at a Carfax clone called Chrome Data. And people would call a customer service representative and type into a Visual Basic application the make model style of a car. Okay. And then they would hit go, and we would pull it out of our massive 50 megabyte database. <laughs> Uh, and then we would OLA automate. I'm using all the old TLAs. Yeah, yeah. TLA Everybody's recognized. hitting up Wikipedia right now trying yeah. to figure out what all these we'd cool use common, things are. We'd yeah. use COM and we'd OLA automate uh, into a, a, a word form on the, server, on the server side. So we had a server farm of machines that would run Word, build these massive multi megabyte, massive uh, <laughs> documents, One and then they would fax them back to the person who called. So you would go and dynamically generate, you know, for each make model style, and you do all of this work. And then we had digi boards, which were racks and racks of modems within PCs, and we had like twelve lines, and we would had a queue. So you'd drop them into the queue, and you'd send them out, and, and then you'd you'd have this. Well, the fax will be there in about twenty minutes once the fax queue has cleared. <laughs> so I kind of worked on that system, and that was nineteen ninety two. Got it. So now it is not 1992. No, a few things have happened since yeah, then. Yeah, uh, and I'm still doing the same work. Um, <laughs> then I worked at a company called Step Technology. That was a, a consulting company. I worked at Nike. I worked at Intel. I taught classic ASP. So is it more of a like a trainer? Like or? a trainer. I was. Okay. I would go in for a week, and I'd you know go and I, well actually at Intel I spent months like in Santa Clara. Uh, down in the bay teaching web development, you know, uh, ActiveX controls. If you recall, there was a time yeah. when you could host a Visual Basic application inside of Internet Explorer. Yeah. Right? So, like, no, no, can't no do that. Now, right? No security problems. No security at all. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> that was yummy. 
Um, and then I did, I worked at Nike, I worked at Intel, I worked at a bunch of startups, I did a bunch of, um, I was a professor, an uh, adjunct professor teaching uh, C Sharp, maybe, I don't know, 2001, two, three, right when it started? So it real new. Oh yeah, it was like point. a new thing, right? Um, and uh, during all of this, I was going to school, which was a challenge. I actually only graduated from college in 2003. Yeah. But I was working since, two, since 1992, because I was going to school at night. I see. And then I started losing credit, because did you know that you have to finish your four-year degree in like a certain amount of time? like airline miles. Right. So just like <laughs> your airline miles expire, your writing 121, 121 credit expires. So then they call you like seven years later, and they go, you haven't graduated yet. Can you go and take writing 121 again? So then it became this crazy treadmill. You had to get off. Where you're trying to like, ah. So I finally graduated in 2003 after having been in the industry for 11 years at that point. Got so it. So that was kind of awkward. Is it, was it like you kind of putting yourself through, through school? Is that the? Basically, I was, I was finding that the work was interesting enough. So I was working nine to five and then I was going to school six to 10. Got it. But that, that is not entirely uh, sustainable, right? Yeah. So you know, for, you're taking 12 credits and then you like get tired and you take nine and then you take six. Going to school three credits a term is kind of like paying the minimum balance on your credit card, <laughs> right? So then eventually you get to the point where you are actually paying the minimum balance and your balance is still going up. So the same thing happened to my, my degree, but I needed to finish it and I ended up with a software engineering degree. During that process, I was teaching as an adjunct because I was the only one that knew .NET. So I the see. agreement that I made was that, how could you throw the credit away if I am also an adjunct professor? but I was the only one without a master's degree. So there was this kind of awkward bit of paradox that occurred <laughs> where I kind of blackmailed them into not throwing my credit away because I was also one of their professors. You prevailed against the bureaucracy. Indeed. That, that's, right. that's so good. So the that's... result was a degree and uh, a number of years teaching. I also taught XML and WSDL, <laughs> and TCP IP and all the good you know, packet sniffer type stuff. Those were the days, folks. Yep, I was basically, uh, now we have self-driving cars that are you can Uber and I was teaching how to rebuild a carburetor. And that's fine. I, I always like to joke about my three-page resume, because I'm <laughs> old, I have a three-page resume, right? But the second page of the resume is all stuff in the 90s that no one uses anymore. So now I just have a resume that has page one and page three. Page two is a checkbox in the, in the, in the Azure cloud, like scale this website. Page two, gone, shredded, because none of that means anything anymore. Although, you know, I, I was, I'm never, I love when you get to go out and like meet the people who still like do those things, like you oh, know, the they, Cobalt, yeah, Cobalt programmers. I assure you, if this whole thing falls apart, there's probably some good Olay uh, well, automation I mean, job listen, for you. One of these days, somewhere. this whole self-driving electric cars, you know, Uber thing is going to fall apart and someone's going to need someone to drive stick shift. I'm your guy, <laughs> You're right? If you need me to double clutch on a hill going uphill, I can do that. Absolutely. I'll drop into, you know, WinDBG, do our thing. It'd be good. Get it done. Cool. So, um, so okay. So now we got to the point where you you got the degree, uh, and so that's the end of Professor Dom. I'm guessing. And, yeah. And at that point, I'm looking for uh, a real job. Uh, well, actually, no. I've been in a real job at that point. Let me think about this. 2003, I had been working as I had gone to principal consultant at Step Technology, and I was doing a lot of whiteboarding for money, which is like flying all over the place, being a virtual CTO. Okay. So you're like, basically like, you know, we're in, we're in over our depth with architecture. We're building a large distributed system. It was the beginning of the DCOM days. Mm -hmm. uh, Donbox was king. We were all reading Essential Comm, trying to understand how to build large systems. It was the day, it was the first bubble. Yeah. So this was all the three letter domains. So I worked at 800.com <laughs> and gear.com, which got bought by Overstock. So all of these short three and four letter acronym places, building you know, what was at the time the most complicated problem in computer science was a shopping cart. Yeah. Right. That could scale. So do you think about this, so it was sort of like line of business training and now you, you've sort of entered consulting? Is that the way at you At that point I got to get into consulting, yeah. right? So I was a CTO for hire mm -hmm. who had not yet been any kind of a CTO. Um, <laughs> but I was, you know, I was building large scale systems, so building big order management systems in Java at Nike that were you know, going from at the time, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of users at once. So I was learning about large, scale, large system scale, um, which was quite large for the time. Uh, that got me into uh, banking, retail online banking. So checking your balances, doing what you know, what at the time was very revolutionary, but now we don't even think about yeah, like exactly. check images and depositing, taking a photograph of a check and depositing it. Like that was the height of tech. 
Um, and then I worked my way up at that company called Carillion to, uh, to chief architect. Uh, so I wasn't the CTO, but I reported to the CTO. And I got to learn about wow. how the CTO bridges the business and the tech. Had a really great CTO. He ended up going off and being the CTO of WebMD. And then Carillion got bought by, uh, got bought by uh, Fiserv? Who got bought, no, got bought by CheckFree. They got bought by Fiserv. So 400 person company. Yeah. Where I was the chief architect, got bought by 4,000 person company, got bought by 40,000 person this company. This vision of a small fish getting eaten Ex by a slightly bigger exactly fish. That's yeah. exactly what happened, right? So yeah. I was like big fish, small pond, inside small fish. Yeah. Chomp, chomp, <laughs> chomp. And then, they, and then Fiserv says, hey, come and be an enterprise architect at Fiserv. And I don't want to work in Excel or whatever, Visio, mm -hmm. and draw UML diagrams. UML, yeah. And I don't want to be a UML diagrammer for money. Uh, and then I was at an O'Reilly conference uh, called Foo Camp, the Friends of O'Reilly Conference. And two people, two people were there, uh, Steve Sanofsky and uh, Scott Guthrie. And I hit it off with Guthrie, and we were talking about uh, the threat, the threat of Ruby on Rails, because it was early days of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, we should do a .NET model view controller, be open source. That'll be kind of like Rails. I said we should do it .NET on nails. Uh, that was rejected. <laughs> but you know, but then I got to come in work with folks like you know Phil Hack and all like the Brad Abrams and all the early .NET people, and we started open source stuff. So then we, you know, you remember we open sourced it when no one was looking, yeah. and then they turned around and they're like, "Oh crap, you've open sourced everything!" Like now we need policies. <laughs> Sorry, well, yeah, exactly. Right now yeah. we'll teach the lawyers how to say yeah, yes. Exactly. We snuck a lot of code out in those days, didn't we? <laughs> so. One thing I like, like again, I, as we were discussing before, is have sort of ambitions that people can kind of watch these episodes and, and sort of see themselves in different things. And I, I'm wondering if there are lessons to be learned for people who are in that, like you were in this beginning part where you're sort of just looking for different things and trying to find what would sort of become a more straightforward dotted line kind of community, mm, okay. working on things in some ways, right? Where you're bouncing from line of business to that. Like, wh how were you doing that? Okay, like, what well, was what was driving it? Was there was it luck? Was it making the right connections that then turned into yeah, opportunities? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, that's a very good question. So first, I I never discount luck. Yeah, and I I think that this is really important. Agreed. There are there is a spectrum of privileges that we all have, you know, mm -hmm. and you can go through the spectrum of the privileges that I have, uh, but as well luck and people making luck for me. I think that our uh, yours and my. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost requirement, our obligation sure. is to be someone else's luck. Yep. So a number of times I was given the warm intro. We call it the warm intro. This is what I call the transitive property of friendship. Okay. Right. So we're cool. Yep. And uh, and then I'm cool with her, high behind the camera. And if then now you're cool, be the transitive property of friendship. So if she vouches for me and you vouch for me, then we're we're cool. Mm -hmm. The warm intro is as simple as you saying, "Hey, you know, my buddy Scott's looking for a job." Or my friend Golnaz, she's looking, she's great, she's fantastic, you should talk to her. That's all you gotta do. You vouch for somebody. Yeah. And that moment, you are passing the trust, A to B to C, and it doesn't get them a free interview, it doesn't get them a job, it simply cracks the door open. Agreed. I do that as much as I can, because I can. I could point to like a half dozen moments, like these sliding doors moments, yeah. you see sliding doors? I, yes, on right. Laserdisc in okay, the good. 90s. Gwyneth yeah. Paltrow is yeah. running to reach under the, plane, the train, and then the movie splits in half. One Gwyneth Paltrow it, gets on the train, yeah. one does not, and her whole life is different. Those moments exist. So what we can do as senior people is make those moments for somebody, and it can be introducing someone, retweeting them, forwarding an email. Sure. You know, and it has to be in a non-transactional way. Like, I'm not keeping score. Right. I'm not being like, you know, Steve keeps calling me and asking me for stuff. No. You just be you on just, my show. Just, just pass, just, <laughs> no, just pass yeah. the love. So I learned that very, very early on because of the behaviors the that were. People were doing it for you. Exactly. I'm not saying like I'm all like, hey, huh, pet, pet, pet. This is about I'm trying to model the behavior of all the successful people I saw. They would unselfishly spread the love so, and lift people up. There was never any of this, I've climbed up the ladder and I kicked the ladder off. Agreed. They reached down the ladder. But I'm curious, like in that model. So you, now you've got these people, and 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 you're vo that are either being vouched for or vouching. And one of the most important things I think with that is like creating this reputation as a spotter of talent or mm -hmm. somebody who like that that network. When you give those things are, are valuable. Do you think there was anything that you were 
that, that made it such that you would be someone that people would want to vouch for? Like, did you do that actively or is that just something you noticed in okay. retrospect? So yeah, and I appreciate you helping break this down because there's silos of information here. So there's the being cool and, and being kind and trying to vouch for people. Then uh, being non-denominational yeah. in my technology religion. Mm. I did VB, I did Java, I did C, I did C++, I did embedded systems, I did large systems, I did scale. The fundamentals of computer science are fundamental. Yep. Right? You, it doesn't matter what language you're doing, you put stuff in a for loop and you sort it. Well, let's talk about algorithms, right? Right. It does not matter whether it's Ruby or Java or .NET or whatever. Polyglot. Mm -hmm. Polyglot's one way to look at it, but, but also, also, but polyglot is the learn all of the languages. I see. But at the root core, uh, the religion is, you know, be fast, scale well, do as little as possible, okay, so that you can do as much of it as possible. I always joke about how if you do nothing, you can do it infinitely, <laughs> right? So you just want to bring your overhead down. So I was thinking about those things, and languages were coming and going. Got it. But I understood the fundamentals of scale of systems of. Um, network latency versus disk latency versus memory latency versus CPU. And I think that for a lot of people, that kind of basic understanding of the metal, yep. whether you're driving an automatic shift or not, there's a clutch until, of course, there isn't. I you see. know what I'm saying? And um, uh, always, being, always knowing one additional layer in the call stack more than your neighbor. I don't say I claim to know down to the, the register level, at least not anymore. But um, if you can drive a stick and your neighbor or your cube mate can't, then that makes you, well, one layer in the call stack more useful. And then being very generous with your giving of knowledge, I would, yeah. go and I would learn about these things. Hey, I, and I use this analogy of driving a stick shift, but you get the idea. Yep. Then do a brown bag. Like, why, what's the point of learning something and then not telling everyone about it? So I started doing brown bags and making like regular weekly lunches and then that brown bag spills into a user group, and that user group spills into a code camp, and that code camp spills into a conference. And in some ways, you, by, by being the person who creates that community, or at least become the seed kernel for it, that you're kind of creating a sort of leadership. Uh, that's what leadership is, basically, yeah, I, I like creating know. something out of nothing. Leadership and, implies like one person, but it's more of like if you're the first person in front of the mob. Yeah. Hey, let's go that way. Come on, everyone. Da -da, and we all march that way. Right. Yeah. Oh. So try to be as generous of my time, generous of my routing of people, and generous of whatever knowledge I have, and then also being unapologetically ignorant about things. <laughs> and, and then giving other people the opportunity to go and give those talks as well. Got it. There's two, put, there's two threads I want to pull on that from that, especially now that we're starting to get a few of these episodes in here, and, and I'm looking for things that are in common across them or interesting. One of them that I thought was interesting that I think we should probably clarify for people who are like in that early part of their career and so don't maybe don't know all of our... Um, all, all the technologies we just listed. A lot of acronyms. Um, is, is that I think that one of the things that was in common with them, they weren't like all the cool ones. They weren't like the, this is the new up and coming one. You were talking about things that like today, if you're cool, you might roll your eyes as, oh, that's enterprise software or something like that. And, and, and I think what you're saying is in some ways you were willing to do those things because you knew that underneath them there was this foundational layer of computer science behind them that was yeah. all the same and the coolness wasn't that interesting. Well, one, one way to look at it is that I've been doing this for almost 30 years. Yeah. And it's the same problem. It's text boxes over data presented to a user. It's user interactions, trying to minimize keystrokes, trying to minimize mouses, trying to make sure that when I hit submit on a form, I don't serialize and then deserialize and then serialize and then deserialize yeah. as it bounces its way across the network. Right? What's the least that I can do cache to get right those text, yeah. Yeah, cache in the right places, do the least yeah. so that you can do the most. Whether it's Java and RMI on a hot Java box in 1996 at Nike, or whether it's Angular and the latest hot new .js today, I'm not trying to be old man who shakes fist at cloud, <laughs> but I am trying to be to recognize that containers and Kubernetes yeah. and you know scale. These are all fundamental ideas that have been thought about going back well into the 40s and 50s and mainframes. Sure, I'm not saying we should look at new stuff with a negative eye, sure. but we should look at it with historical context. Not being biased against them is what, I, what oh, I'm never, hearing. That. Never, like, never being like them. kind of above this, oh. But, but I think that one, as one moves into the future, looking yeah. back into history is important. I have long believed that when I stop being a programmer, I will go and be a professor, mm. and I will teach what I think is not taught, which is this, the computer science history classes. We learn lots of computer science, but when did, when did anyone learn history? 
in particular, the ideas and no, how, I mean, I don't, how they yeah, evolved. Maybe over I'm time. missing out. Are there yeah. computer science history courses? Right? Do people learn about? I got to go to the um, uh, to Bletchley Park oh. in the UK yeah. and like see the an Enigma machine. And Damien Edwards and I actually sat there and we got there and on a random Tuesday. And there was an older gentleman who's probably in his 80s sitting there, and he was just chilling, and no one else was around. And he spent there. He spent two hours explaining the Enigma. We actually encrypted and decrypted on the Bomba machine a real message as oh, he sat there cool. because he had nothing else to do, and he knew yeah. that stuff. Like nobody learns that. But if you look at that and then compare like how RSA works and encryption today, like the concepts are all there. So. Knowing again how to drive a stick shift, got it. Make you a better programmer. And indeed, if you're a Seattle uh, person watching this, oh, the, the living, the computer, living museum. computer museum. Just go there, find whoever the person yes. with the longest gray beard is, or the, you know, or the, the longest, longest, longest gray braid. braid or whatever. Yeah. You know, find someone there who is older and ask them to teach you something. They are amazing. Yes, everyone's got a an auntie or a grandma or a grandpa who was a programmer in the yeah. past. Get a, stop watching this show right now. Go and get your your video recorder, or your iPhone, and go talk to Grandma about when she was doing paper punch yeah, cards. Yeah, for sure. And capture that stuff. The, you can actually go to the Living Computer Museum, put your name on a punch card, and punch it, and take it home. Yeah, love that stuff. Did I just that think that kids. that not to wallow in the past, but to to sit on the past and respect it as we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Uh, and the second thread I wanted to pull on that, again, is a theme that keeps coming back in these conversations, is you were uh, talking a little bit about the going one layer further down in the call stack. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, like, for instance, um, uh, David Fowler talked about how um, really having a mentor teach him how to do debugging was absolutely critical to his yeah, early success. Yeah, yeah. Mauni likewise said that, like, you know, having a mentor sit down with her and go through how uh, you know how how to really understand code through through case studies mm -hmm. of what code you don't own mm. um, really does was a big powerful accelerator to that. And then of course when you started you, the first thing you're saying is this idea of like how do you how do you get that next layer down and really understand the fundamentals. So I'm curious um, how you learned those initial things. Like you, in some ways, you're saying that that's a thing that helped you stand out in these early times and then the fact that you would go and share that knowledge. Yeah. So how did you get that? How did you get there in the first place? Like, um, I like that word mentor and I have a lot of mentorship programs. I have mentors myself. I have yeah. mentees. But David, actually I was talking to David Fowler and he juxtaposed the difference between the word mentor and sponsor. Yeah. And he almost said like a, like a sponsor is like a super powered mentor. Right. You know, they will not only teach you these things, but they'll also kick down doors, they'll back you up, they'll defend you, mm -hmm. they're a shield, and they are, you know, a, 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 a helper. So I had those early on like in school. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that since my first, like when I was 12, and my sixth grade teacher let me sneak into after school and use, you know, the only computer that the school <laughs> had, like the Apple II, there was like, there wasn't one per kid or one per classroom, there was one in the school letting me see that, you know? the privilege of my dad selling the van. I literally can tell you like the most transformative moment in my life was coming home from school one day, the van was gone. I walk into the house, hey, where's the van? Well, we went to Sears and we bought this Commodore 64 Ooh. for $300, which oh is a God. huge amount of money, plus 299 plus 199 for the, I think it was like 500, Disc 600 bucks, something. just driving the monitor. Yeah. And they bought that because the principal of the school had told them that your son is getting into a wrong crowd and he's hanging out on the road behind the school and hanging you know, doing stuff I need, didn't need to be doing. Uh -huh. He should be inside and he's good at this. Think about investing in a computer. If my fifth grade teacher hadn't talked to the principal, hadn't talked to my dad who had a van to sell, I would be, you know, probably voted most likely to be convicted of a white collar crime. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's Those powerful. are sponsors, not just mentors. They put they put themselves on the line for you, and that's so important. So hunt those people down and collect them. So, but how did you do it, right? Like, so I agree with you on the principle. How but did I'm, I'm pushing the first one? It was luck, yeah. right? Like, yeah, how, how, why, why did my fifth grade teacher spot me and not someone else, or which of the, you know, hundred kids that they had to deal with? I don't know. Um, being inquisitive, asking the right questions, putting in the work, the kind of stuff that I try to tell my 11-year-old and my 13-year-old now is that don't live your life by default. Mm -hmm. If you just accept the defaults, then default stuff will happen. If you try to do, if you at least try, mm -hmm. 
then the thing will either happen or it won't, but at least you tried, mm -hmm. as opposed to just you woke up and then the thing happened. So intentionality, right. I would say. I, I, I was told to be intentional by my parents. I applied intentionality to my life. Stuff happened. Yes, some luck. Yes, some good effort. Um, that intentionality, though, was applied more, more when I became the chief architect of Carillion because the CTO was someone I really looked up to. Uh -huh. And he was a gentleman who had an MBA okay. and a master's in engineering, also was an Air Force major. So this was an incredibly well-rounded individual who had a foot in the discipline of the military, had a foot in the discipline of business, and a foot in the discipline of solid engineering. And he showed me as a, as a sponsor, as a mentor of mine, yeah. to go and like go into a meeting. How do you show up at a bank and shake the hand of a senior VP of some bank and act like you belong, right? And if you're, uh, if you're an older, just to put it in really frankly, frank terms, if you're an older white guy mentoring a younger white guy about how to go into rooms of older white guys and, sure. and, and navigate, navigate, that is in itself difficult. Even more so if you're a woman or a young woman or a person of color, how wonderful would it be if you had that sponsor that comes in with you, knocks the door down, gives you that transitive property of friendship and says, hey, this is the best person we've got on the team, let's see their presentation by then lending your privilege to that person temporarily, it knocks down some barriers that they would otherwise have to deal with themselves. That's the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. So um, luck to start with and then intentionally hunting it down and then now intentionally giving it out. Those are the one, two, three punch right there. So there, there are a couple of different types of things that you're learning in these stories, right? One of them mm -hmm. is these sort of like um, how to, you know, how to have um, conscientious, the drive, the, the intentionality. ability, to, intentionality is the word, yeah. Um, and then there's also the element of actually knowing how to dig through those things. I'm curious how you acquired that skill specifically of, um, you know, how to get that layer down. I agree with you that, like, there were a number of things that had to happen uh, in I order to set saying. that up. Um, my, I'm the first one to go to college in my family, but my parents always went one layer down. My dad was a fireman, okay. my mom was a zookeeper, but my mom could have just, and did, shovel elephant crap, but she also understood the behavior of the elephants. She chose that, like, I, yes, my job is to shovel poo, but also knowing how the animal behaves is gonna make my job easier. If I'm gonna work with hawks, or I'm gonna work with the different animals that she works with, knowing how that works is, is important. My dad was a fireman. Being a fireman, in, at least in America, is a large part of medical Thing. Sure. You're almost a kind of a nurse or a doctor. So understanding humans is going to make your job better and easier. But then my dad was also a, a woodworker. He's not an engineer, but he's always using tools. So there was never a sense that I couldn't go one layer deeper. And we were also very poor. So I'm in this family of working with your hands, people. Sure. We've got animals around us. We've got, uh, we're dealing with people. My dad's dealing with people all the time. Something in the house breaks. Are we going to just throw it away and buy a new one? No. I guess this weekend we're opening up the television and fixing it. Got it. Um, you know, we don't have enough money for, uh, I remember this very clearly, we don't have enough money for the furnace. Let's build a wood stove on the side of the house. We actually built, the, you know, built an actual wood stove and added the chimney on the side of the house. Like, there's a problem. Let's understand the problem. Let's fix the problem space. It was a kind of programming, except we were you know, building a wood stove on the side of the house. You learned or, kind of that algorithmic thinking yeah, style yeah, of just things. Systems Systematic. thinking. Got it. Systems thinking. My friend Keisha Rogers talks about this. We are spending all this time teaching kids how to code, mm -hmm. but we never teach them how to think. But my dad was like, hey, the toaster's broken. Well, I mean, take it apart. Is there power to the wall? Is there, is the, is there power in the building? Is the neighborhood's power out? Like, that's systematic thinking. Got uh, it. Simplistic thinking would be throwing it out and trying to buy a new toaster and then discovering that the power's been out the fuse the whole time. <laughs> right. Cool. Right? So yeah, I would say my parents were never afraid to break those problems down. Got it. That's really cool. So I, I, the next thing I kind of wanted to chat about a little bit was um, like your job at Microsoft is a, a lot of it, I guess, is, is about building these communities. I, I, I'm curious, again, how you kind of like developed skills in order to do those things and also how like bringing customer in, I think, is another big Hmm. topic that I'm interested in for PM type people who are watching this? Or actually, let me, let me rewind that a little bit. Let me put it this way. What skills do you feel like you really had to learn as you're making that transition into this sort of like more of a program manager space out of what you were doing before as like uh, either a consultant or, you know, working with the CTO? 
I try to practice, and I think a skill that I either have or have developed is that of extreme empathy. Okay. We all like to say that we can put ourselves in that person's shoes. We never really can. You can never be anyone that you're not, but mm -hmm. you can try mm -hmm. to see it from their perspective. So you can be a really good advocate for the customer if you can truly understand what they're coming from. And that means their context. So whether I'm meeting with I always use the example of the IT department of Little Debbie Snack Cakes, right? <laughs> like, what's their job? They're shipping snack cakes, right? But they have IT departments. They have a business. What are their business problems? You know, if we do this thing in .NET, you know, butterfly flaps its wings in .NET, and Little Debbie Snack Cakes has a failed deployment, yeah. how can you go from point A to point Z and do that? And that is, the only way to do that is through true extreme empathy for the folks at Little Debbie, or at Do It Best Hardware, or at Home Depot, or at you know Chase Manhattan, whoever our customers are. I don't know if any of those people are our customers. Um, <laughs> so but, write in and tell but, us. No, but it's a very. <laughs> the point is, it's a very diverse yeah. group of people, right? Like yeah. you know, uh, you just you never really know. And we sometimes in the Redmond reality distortion field forget that this little bit of code, or this little flag, or this little web.config thing is going to roll its way all the way to China into some programmer who you've never met before his machine, and they're either going to not read the docs or whatever. So to use a, a term from Rico Mariani, uh, how can we have them fall into the pit of success, success right? Mm -hmm. Empathy, empathy, empathy. Like, it's hard. It takes energy. It, it gives you a headache right here. But the number one thing that we need to do here, and I think that Julia and John and the folks in leadership. That's our VP. In our, our VP and of, the other VP. Uh, yes, the VPs. The VPs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. So Julie and John are always trying to say, like, "Hey, like, don't forget about these people and those people." Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how far that empathy goes, but as you enter a community, you have to be able to think about uh, things from their perspective. So, how did you learn to do that? I don't know. Um, I never thought about it because I've never been interviewed you by you before. <laughs> I'm annoying. I'm sorry. No, about I, think, I think you're doing a great job because you're asking me questions that I've never been asked before, which is a good a good sign of a good interviewer. Um, I don't know how, how does empathy start. I mean, I think it comes by there's a certain amount of not having stuff. Um, so like, have, I always want I always try to raise my kids like you know they have a privilege in the sense that they have some money but they don't know it yet, right? So you want to raise your kids with enough money that they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing, yeah. right? The Warren Buffett kind of a thing. But, but, but when we had nothing, when we were poor, there was a certain amount of, of empathy for other people who were even poorer. So you're still doing volunteer work. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you volunteer. Like There's this hierarchy. So we were always thinking about other people, about other family members, about other people in the community, other people on our street. In some ways it's like practice. Empathy is baked in when you're at that, kind of at, at that, at that background level of, of um, suffering isn't the right word because everyone, just, it's not the oppression Olympics, but you know, uh, everyone has a level at which they come in, right? So I think there's a certain amount of not being born with a silver spoon that mm -hmm. gives you some empathy. I think travel causes some empathy, but I didn't travel anywhere until I was like 24. 526. I didn't get a passport until I was like in my early 20s. Travel for me was a road trip to the beach. Yeah. You know. Um, I don't know. What is it that Can causes someone? Guess? What is it that causes someone to watch something on the news, and see a famine and be empathetic versus changing the channel? What were you gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say like the one thing that I noticed is, is as you were narrating the the story was that even though. Um, that, that you had moved across a bunch of different worlds, right? Like effectively, you ended up in a room with the bank president that you wouldn't have imagined. Yeah, and that of. was super weird too, because I don't like golf or smoke cigars or whatever. Yeah, my, when I was when I was uh, my dad it was like a accountant guy, and so he always was like, as I was coming up, and he wanted to help me be successful, mm -hmm. and he wasn't. He was like good at computers for an accountant, but not a computer guy, and so like he kept being like. Son, you got you got to learn how to play golf, and I'm like, Dad, I promise you, it's a business don't skill. Right, as a business skill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But he didn't understand. He, that wasn't a distinction that was occurring to him because he didn't have like there, a, a there, model. There was for a it. time when I was meeting with literally the, like a senior vice president at a major bank, and it was literally like a movie. It was country club, cigars, big giant fat steaks, and I don't like eat that. Uh, alcohol, I don't drink, so I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't eat big giant fat steaks. Like it was just extremely. A caricature of like you know one of those that movie where Eddie Murphy swaps with the other old guys trading places. trading places. That was just 
total fish out of water, but being able to move through that somewhat elegantly and recognize that that is a space that's not my space, but I could at least not embarrass myself in that space was a challenge. But in, in some ways, it gives you this sort of opportunity to practice the idea of, of being in different sure. different places and you get, get the ability It also to... taught me that I don't want to make that, I don't want anyone to ever feel like that. I so see. I try to avoid making those spaces for other people. Yeah. Like even when we're at like a convention, you know, like we're for like a mm. Microsoft build or something, you, you, you know, you work the booth and we're, you and I are hanging at the booth. You got to open the circle. Yeah. Because if you have a bunch of people uh, especially a bunch of people that are all the same flavor, uh, and then they're all in a huddle, like anyone to break into that, it's impossible. But if you simply open and, and, and become a row and go, hi, you having fun? You, ha- you having a good time with the show? What? Uh, you're, I'm the, you're the first person I've talked to since I landed. You know, like that moment is how you open those spaces up, and that, that must have been baked in since day one. Yeah. Uh, another topic. Uh, I'm really interested, like one thing that at least I think is that you really excel at technical communication, right? Aww. Like a, cool, this is you know presentations, so um, you know, like presentations, stuff like that. Thank like, you. That's uh, very kind. And I'll go with my standard question. And how did you learn that? Like, how, how did that it's, happen? It's, so it's empathy, right? Empathy, analogies, uh, stand-up comedy, uh, comedy sports, uh, improv classes. Interesting. Um, uh, uh, Toastmasters. Extemporaneous speech. I'm getting a sense of the intentionality again. Yeah. Like, right now, trying not to say, um. Yeah. That's intentional, right? Like, a, a, a space, a pause, a moment is better than an um. I'm not getting it perfect, but one can try to speak with some intentionality, or one can simply attach their brain to their mouth and just see what comes out. So there's this idea sometimes that, like, if you take, like, even if you're not the best in the world at something, if you're, like, top you know, 10, 20 percentile of two things and <laughs> you can know. kind of combine them. And so, like you mentioned, you mentioned I am comedy. mediocre at a lot of things. But, but, but in a unique combination, well, right? I, I think of myself as a Swiss army knife, mm-hmm. which is just a, just a lousy knife. And it's a mediocre <laughs> pair of scissors. You know what I mean? And it's the power of the Swiss, it's why the power, the, the Swiss army is the power that they are today, um, right? But it's just like, here's this mediocre tool <laughs> that uh, they can do a whole bunch of stuff though. And they're so convenient though, because it's all in one tool. So I am that tool. Okay, <laughs> tell me how you brought, like, you used comedy as a way to build, you know, a career stuff. That's been important, What is comedy, right? though? Comedy is looking at things, yeah. both a way that no one's ever sure. thought Surprise. about, which makes you tickle and why you laugh, because, like, oh, I never thought, that is true. <laughs> oh, you know, that is funny. Computer people are nerds. That's crazy. Never thought about it that way. <laughs> you know, there's a, say it in a way that no one ever said, said, it, said it before. That's an analogy. Right. So the stick shift analogy, right? Uh-huh. Using stick shift to describe the call stack of a computer to explain Uber, Tesla, you know, continuous variable transmission, automatic transmission, stick shift, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's a perfect, damn near, darn near, excuse me, darn near perfect analogy. Um, if you get a good thing like that, you've all had those teachers that are trying to explain the Spanish Revolution or whatever, and then they come up with an analogy and they go, yeah, it's like this. And you go, oh. This thing I am unfamiliar with is exactly like this thing I am familiar with. It tickles something. It gets the neurons firing. It's both funny. It's interesting. It's uh, it's edutaining. So you so imagine you're like uh, let's use our your empathy skills. And I'll build on your idea. And we'll uh, so let's imagine you're like you know five years into your career mm-hmm. and you're a uh, you're trying to you know follow into this thing where you wanted to get more. Uh, up in front of people, you want to be mm-hmm. able to do the edutainment thing that, that you're talking about. Do you recommend that people go and, you know, take improv classes? Like, how do you feel about I that? I think that there's value in taking improv classes generally because yeah. it's, it's simply outside of most people's comfort zone. And it teaches you something that is called yes and. Yeah. Which is super important. I was talking to Golnaz, our director, about that earlier. Like, you don't... If you're vibing with someone like like you and I, mm-hmm. if you ask me a question and you're the interviewer as you are, and I'm like, well, no. Just ends it. Like, that was awkward. Now the whole thing's messed up. But yes, and. It's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Or, well, yes, and, but, you know, not really. But take, we're, this is a dance that we're doing here. This isn't scripted. We're trying to figure that out. Technical conversations are like that as well. I think I know who you are. So given the context I have, I will explain a concept. Oh, I didn't understand where you were coming from. I'm going to then shift gears and come up with another way to explain this concept until I have clicked that, okay, P 
people in this context from this background understand this thing this way. So if I'm explaining .NET to COBOL programmers or mainframe programmers or Java programmers or Node programmers, I have a gear for each one so that they might understand .NET. That then builds up this toolbox of stuff. Just like a comedian was going to go yeah. and roll in and doing comedy in LA is different than Portland, is different from downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. I will bring different jokes. I will bring them in a different way. They will land differently. Uh, that is applying both empathy, uh, empathy as well as a, a toolbox of stuff. So where you should start as a junior programmer is, can you explain it to yourself? Mm -hmm. Like you shouldn't be like worried about talking at a conference or the local thing. You need to talk to your rubber duck, <laughs> right? You know about rubber duck programming? Do you know about this? No, I do not. Oh, my friend. Okay, go out there and, and do the Googling with Bing for rubber duck programming. This is when you have a problem. How many times have you had a problem? Real technical problem. It's been bugging sure. you for hours. You call someone, and in the process of explaining oh, it to them, yeah. you've solved it. Well, you can bypass the embarrassment by not explaining it to them, by just getting a rubber duck and putting it on your thing and saying, <laughs> okay, listen, here's what's going on. I'm, I'm doing this, and I dereference the, and then I, you know, the free-threaded marshaller, and you go, oh, oh, I didn't, there you, thank you, rubber duck. Yeah. I, I actually, I, that's, it's interesting you say that, because like, I, sometimes I feel like, um, I need another person to, st I know, to I know sit it's bad. next to me I and do Damien it. I call Damien and waste his time all the time. And he's like, you're an idiot, Damien I, says to me. I'm like, I just needed to tell somebody. And he's like, talk to yourself. It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> but my point is, talk to your teammates. Find, and this is important, especially for, un for underprivileged or uh, underrepresented people, you need to find a place where you can safely mm -hmm. do that and, and, and be dumb. Yeah. So a sponsor... A mentor or a series of mentors or a positive and inclusive team is somewhere where if you and I were working together in a project, I would be concerned that how many times could I call you, ask dumb questions or walk through dumb, yeah. uh, dumb in air quotes, uh, scenarios until you flip the bozo bit on me and you're like, man, this one's a bozo. He didn't know anything. How do we build a working relationship where you know it is okay that I am going to ask these seemingly uneducated questions, but you know that I fundamentally understand it? but there's maybe some blind spots. So rather than you judging me and flipping the bit on me and going, up, oh, I'm sick of him, you go, hey, I've noticed that TCP IP has been a challenge for you, or DNS is a thing that you may have a misunderstanding about. I would encourage you to get some coaching in that area. Da, 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 da. Right, like basically help them see what they're right. not seeing. And, and, but, but you could just say, well, he doesn't even understand how HTTP works, and then now we're not cool anymore. Yeah, I don't remember where it was I first saw it, but like one thing I just gravitated to in terms of behaviors of leaders that really, mm -hmm. really resonates with me is being the person who will say, uh, you know what, I don't understand this in a meeting. Like, especially if you're running the meeting and you're like, like I, so I'm like the quarterback for .NET yep, Core exactly. 3.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm like in charge of this really expensive meeting with all these people who are way smarter I than love me. That you, that's empathy, right, by the way. You just pointed out that it's an expensive meeting. You know the hourly rate of these, you know, tw more than 10, 15 people, that's like a $1,000 meeting, right? Yeah, and, and I'm just like, I, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. He explains to me. And then I, they know that by, ed, you know, the process of educating me educates the room. Yep. And, and also, you didn't put it on someone who's junior yeah. to say that. I've gone so far as to make sure that the juniors can text me or chat me as a back channel during the meeting so that they don't have to put their reputation on the line and I will ask the dumb question for them. That's, that makes a safe place cool. for new people. That is a really cool idea. You should try that. Yeah. Seriously, because you can throw yourself on the ceremonial grenade, and you've got as many lives as possible. They may only have, in their minds, two yeah. or three lives. True, true or not. Yeah. Whether it's true or not doesn't yeah. change the fact that they feel, feel that way. Yeah, exactly. And there's no amount of you saying that they shouldn't that will change that fact. So uh, my friend Ann Juan Simmons calls it lending your privilege. I got unlimited lives. Maybe not unlimited, but I got at least a dozen. Yeah, yeah. Where I could ask I got some dumb, capital to burn. I got, oh, absolutely. I could yeah. ask some dumb questions and Guthrie will forget. And then I'll, <laughs> you know, I could probably ask a dumb question a month. So why not just give that dumb question to someone else and let them, and again, I don't mean to say dumb. I'm using that as a colloquialism to just indicate a, a slightly uneducated question. Yeah, and in, in some ways it's like, it, and, and then you, I, at the beginning when I started being, I said, I always said to myself, I will be the person in the room who will ask the question that. Good, um, and, good. and then, but the thing is, at the beginning, I thought I was taking this risk, oh, right, no, you know? No risk but then, you. like, you You're know, you don't have to do no that a couple of times. No? no, no, even when I was junior, I'm saying, right? Oh, well, like, again, it all like depends in, or on the in a junior. medium or whatever. It all depends on the person, right? If you, if this is your first job out of college, yeah, right, and you're in an underrepresented group, 
uh, I think it would be really hard for you to convince yourself that you have unlimited lives. And it was. And, and then when I'm, I'm... It depends on the group. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but it, I would occasionally take that risk. And it's good. And, and, the, and the more that you build up, you realize that there are some questions that are dumb. Yeah. And there are other ones like, oh, what was that acronym? Oh, sorry, I, we, we didn't, you know, we have a glossary or whatever, problem solved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, setting people up for success and making that safe place is all part of inclusion. Cool. All right. Um, we're way off my uh, format, but that's fine. Do we this have is a good conversation. That doesn't matter. But, uh, like, uh, do you have any particular pieces of uh, career advice that, that, that you received that you did think was valuable? And do you have any that you felt was like, uh, somebody told me this, and oh, boy, yes. was that BS. Number that one just career advice, number one life changing big deal. Uh, John Udell, okay. who was a very famous blogger who worked at Microsoft, who's also a librarian, told me, uh, don't waste your keystrokes. And I've turned that into a personal mantra. Okay? okay. So you know how old you are. You know how fast you type. There are a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we don't hang out as much as we should, but let's say that after this you send me a great question. And I'm like, you know, I don't really know you that well. Do you really deserve the gift? of 4,000 of my keystrokes, I've only got like a couple of billion left. Like, what should I do? Like, it was a great question you asked and I could email it back to you and you'd be like, thanks. I'm like, really, 5,000 keystrokes and I get thanks? Like, <laughs> I don't even know if that even Such worked or not. Yeah. So where should I put those keystrokes? I should not put them in email, ever. Email is where keystrokes go to die. He <laughs> says you put them anywhere with a permalink, anywhere with a URL. SharePoint, OneNote, a wiki, a knowledge base, a blog, anywhere. So I don't write long emails. If, you, if I get more than five sentences into an email, I'm either going to call you or I'm going to write a blog post. So when you call me later and ask me a question, I'll be like, oh, that's an amazing question. Free blog post. I type the blog post. I blog it. I send you the URL. You say thanks. And then <laughs> every additional person who visits yeah. that blog post multiplies my power. Do that for 20 or 30 years and you will be a semi-famous blogger. That is a fantastic place for us to end. Uh, thanks very much, Scott, <laughs> for, for coming on board. Thank you.